this is our galley and it's also our briefing area. And when you first come in for one of the programs, what we're doing is bringing people in here to just introduce ourselves, let you know what you're going to be expecting on Mars. So let's start by going into our base hub. This is basically an area where all of the different labs come together. And also this would be our transport in and out of the base if we were going to one of our outposts. We're not going to be getting out on the Martian surface today. We've got some radiation hazards, so we're just going to be working in the base. If you look out the window, you'll be seeing one of our launch pads there. You'll notice we've been having a dust storm, so we're coming out of that dust storm right now. We're in a lean operating mode. We're going to start you out in our operations center. You're going to get to work in here. Now, we do have two different operations centers for the base, uh, the main one and the auxiliary one. This is off center B, since you're new trainees, we're just going to start you out in here. And we start with a little introduction video that welcomes you to operations and explains what you're going to be doing in the operations center. Had 12 people in the room or 24 people in the room, each person would be assigned to a different duty station. So I'm the only one with an RFID badge right now, so it's only assigned to me. But in each one of these pods, we have three different workstations that are all working collaboratively using information on the main screen and the information that comes up on your workstation screen to solve some problems to keep the base running. We have had a crash of an unmanned supply vehicle. And if you come around this way, the station that I've got activated right now, you get an idea of how these different stations work. So this is our communications and cartography area. So here we communicate with Earth and all of the different outposts about the crash. We download satellite images, and then we prepare maps for our rovers out in the field. So this is going to give me instructions. And as I touch, it's going to ask me some questions just to make sure that I understand what I'm supposed to be doing here tells me my job, and then I'm going to use information on the main screen and my screen to create the maps that we're going to need in order to send the rovers out in the field. So this is telling me some information that I need, but I have to look up at this big map to really do what I'm supposed to do here. And this is telling me where each thing is located. So I have information on my screen. Once I'm ready, I can submit that, and it goes on to my next task. Each time it gives me information that I need and then gives me another task to complete. On the main screen, it explains our master task list, what each of these stations needs to do, tells us how much time we have to complete it, and when we're finished, it's going to give us a score. Then what we're going to do is the six people who are working in this area are going to move over to the next area and do the tasks in that station. After 15 minutes, we'll move to the third area and then the fourth area. So we spend about 90 minutes in the operations lab, but we actually work in four different areas doing four completely different types of assignments while we're in here. This is a little bit competitive too because if we actually had more than just me running this right now, at the end of the rotation, not only is it going to give me my individual score for my workstation, it gives the score for the entire pod and it tells which of the four pods had the most efficiency. So it's a little bit of collaboration and a little bit of competition in operation. We're going to engineering next. So in our engineering lab, what we do is we test different systems to see what we want to implement on the Martian base. One of the hazards of living on Mars is that we do have dust storms. Unlike the movie The Martian, they're not really dangerous because Mars, the atmosphere is so thin that if we were in a 100 mile an hour wind, it would feel like I was throwing feathers at you, basically. But we do accumulate a, a lot of dust, and we use solar panels and photovoltaics to provide power for the base. So when it gets obscured by dust, we need a dust mitigation system. Now, NASA has developed several different dust mitigation systems, but what we're working on in our engineering lab is testing some other ideas to see if they would work. And our, our current challenge is programming a swarm of robots to work together to clear debris off of the solar panel. As we're doing that, we're generating energy, and it's reflected on the screen over here. So let me turn this on for you. So what happens here, as the robots are running and they're clearing off the debris, you'll notice it's going to change our wattage output. And as we get our wattage output, we drag it down into here, and it starts creating a bar graph.
We would have four robots running simultaneously, controlled from each of the four stations, and the challenge is to program them so they're pushing the debris off the panel, but not just crashing into each other. So you've got to get some collaboration going here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a program here to let this robot do, do its thing. And it only takes a few seconds because we use a drag and drop programming system. We can explain real quickly how this works. A little bit of tutorial, get everybody working on it. So we're gonna have four people programming at the same time. Everybody hits play at the same time. And we're gonna see if this is a program that we wanna keep or if we wanna modify it. And as he's working, he is changing. That was, that's not a very effective program, apparently. There we go. I want to push the stuff off the edge. So I'm going to stop that. And I notice he is coming towards the edge at some place. I'm going to start him up again rather than changing my program this time. I'm just going to change where I put him. Let's see if that works better. And we just have them keep on talking together, changing strategies, changing the program, changing where they've got the robot placed. That wasn't very good either, but you get the idea. Yeah. And as they're generating the power, we're bringing it over. And finally, we're giving the task of taking the power that we have generated and making a power allocation system for the base. We decide what we're going to shut down or what power usage we're going to reduce. As we make our choices, it gives us the consequences. It also tells us how long we'll be able to last with the choices that we made. Hannah, would you hit the ones on that side for me, please? It doesn't really matter which one she picks for the sake of this. So she's going to turn off the hot water every other day, moving in with the lights. Turn off 25% of the lights, pull that up. We're going to reduce our liquids by 75 percent. There you go. Reduce our electrolysis output. There you go. We're going to submit that program. We got four stars for that. Our crew health is only about 60 percent. Our base operations is 60 percent. But the goal is that we would continue to do this using the engineering process until we got that where we wanted it to be. Okay. Stop now, overachiever. <laughs> so in our life sciences lab, we work in the botany section. Come on in here. So our botany lab is done in full partnership with NASA. We've worked for about two years developing this, working very closely with the scientists in NASA food production. We're using a lot of the same indoor farming techniques, testing some of the same crops, nutrients, uh, grow lamps, things like that. But we're also branching out into things they haven't tested yet. And the data that we collect in here is going to be used in some of their studies so they can decide what they want to continue as an experiment. Eventually, the work that our guests do in this lab may help actually determine which plants are going to be grown on Mars one day. So in the greenhouse, right now we have a number of experiments. Some of them are controlled experiments. We have a group that's going to be coming in soon they're going to be harvesting these microgreens. We also have recently planted a number of plants. We've got some that are shorter term for experiments, some that are longer term experiments. So here we have some peppers that we're growing. These tomato plants are Rutgers tomatoes. The seeds went up in 1985 on the Challenger, so they received a lot of radiation. When we planted, only two of those seeds germinated, and we're waiting to see what kind of fruit we get from those. Then we've got our Tiny Tim tomatoes. We're trying to grow compact varieties. These have been producing very well. We've got a number of different leafy greens if you'd like to taste some of those. NASA's looking for things that have high nutritional value, grow in a small space, grow relatively quickly, are low on um, susceptibility to diseases, and finally things that have strong flavors. One of the things that we've found is when astronauts are in space, their sense of taste is not as sharp, so they like things with really strong flavors. So we're growing a wide variety. Our uh, latest project, NASA's looking at nutritional value of dwarf peas, so we're starting to grow some vining um, vegetables. 
So the peas are going to actually grow up here. As they grow, we'll move the lights higher and higher. This whole wall is going to be filled with different lines of peas and beans one day. Lips. Have a taste. <laughs> Surprise? Yeah. What do you think yes. it tastes like? Some people describe it as Granny Smith apple. Yeah, but stronger. Yeah, it's got that tartness to it. It's good. The um, Amara mustard is another favorite. And these are all seeds that we got from NASA. They're current experiments that they're running over there. The ones that I'm cutting are not part of a controlled experiment, so I can just take that for you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I like the other one better. <laughs> So yeah, sour and uh, not Ooh. yeah, not so strong. The Amara mustard. Some people call it the steak plant. It's almost like a piece of beef with a lot of horseradish on it. We've got wasabi as well. Would you like a tomato? Sure, thank you. Looks like we've got a tomato in the front there that's ready for picking. In fact, I'm going to let you pick that yourself. Would you reach in there, find one that you like? You don't need to put it in the bowl, right? Because you picked it yourself. Like any other tomatoes. Exactly, yeah. But our tiny tin tomatoes have been doing really well. That's as big as they're going to get. They are a determinate variety, so we're looking for things that are not going to fall in and get yeah. outrageous for the space that we have. So when guests come in here, they're going to do three different activities. First activity they're going to do is plant something, and their plant their planting will be according to the NASA protocols. We're going to enter the data in the computer and it becomes part of the experimental procedure. So all the ones that you see that are currently planted are ones that are in the experiment. Then they're also going to be harvesting something that's ready for harvest, weighing, measuring, running it through a number of different pieces of equipment to gather the data for NASA. And then they're also going to be coming in and just making sure that the plants are healthy, adding any nutrients that need to be added, uh, looking for pests, diseases, and and then we have a final little activity where they take everything that they've learned and they create a plan for what we're going to plant in our next greenhouse. Okay. Something that's going to produce the most food in the shortest amount of time. Very cool. Lots of